So I'm going to be talking about everyone's favorite topic here, which is uh, cystectomies. Um, and so here's my glamorous shot. Um, and I just wanted to kind of jump right into it just in the interest of time. But uh, at the end of the day, what, what I want to do is just kind of examine some of the oncologic evidence, some of the morbidity associated with uh, open versus robotic cystectomy, learning curve, and cost. And so that's kind of what the focus of this talk is going to be. Uh, and so we all know uh, open radical cystectomy is the gold standard treatment for patients with muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. It's got a lot of morbidity, you know, uh, uh, just because of the patient population, average age being 70. There's a steep learning curve in, in order to do it uh, appropriately and, and properly, and it really improves with experience. And I think that over time, as we got better and better at pelvic robotic surgery, i.e. prostatectomies, we we're slowly translating this into cystectomy. And then with, after you get the cystectomy portion out, done uh, and mastered, then maybe even potentially doing the diversion uh, using the robot. And so if you look at the trends over time from 2002 to 2012, uh, you can see that, that there is an increase in the amount of um, or the percentage of, of cases done robotically for cystectomy. This is from the uh, SEER Medicare database. Uh, there's another one here from the National Cancer Database looking at 2010 to 2013. There's an increase in the robotic approach from about 25% to about 39%. Now, six years have gone beyond this, and I imagine that number is going to get higher and higher, especially as we have more and more residents being more comfortable and familiar with the robotic approach. So again, here are the comparison points I want to talk about, uh, oncologic outcomes, morbidity, the uh, learning curve, and the cost associated with uh, robotic uh, cystectomy. And so first of all, if, if you're going to do a robotic cystectomy, you want to make sure it's oncologically equivalent to a open cystectomy, right? It wouldn't make any sense to do it using this. And a lot of this was born out of the fact that early on, uh, some, some papers, I mean, one out of Cornell showed that you had weird recurrences if you did it robotically. You'd have you know odd locations for recurrence within two years, and they said, well, is it because we're using the robot? Is it because the gas is swirling around and moving these cancer cells inside the, uh, inside the abdomen when you have the pneumoperitoneum? And so first, I'd like to start off with looking at a meta-analysis, just kind of looking at a big overview. This combined a lot of papers, two randomized controlled trials, uh, 10 prospective, seven retrospective uh, studies, and they have about 700, 900 uh, uh, robot and open patients. And so you can see here that uh, here are all the all the uh, studies here, kind of summarizing all that. But you can you can see here if when you're looking at surgical margin, that's probably one of the oncologic outcomes you want to look at. Really, no difference between open and robotic in this meta analysis. You can see here from this forest plot, really no difference there. And then, what about lymph nodes? You get more or less lymph nodes if you use a robotic approach in this series. When you pull them all together, it actually seemed to favor uh, robotic. Again, it's a meta-analysis, multiple. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. But again, not inferior if you use a robot. You could still get uh, do an adequate lymph node dissection. Well, then this kind of uh, fueled some of the further studies that, uh, with DIP and Perex that said, let's make a randomized trial at the, and see if we can find out if there's a difference. And so if you're going to look at it, that you want to pick the right outcome. And so the primary endpoint was going to be two-year progression-free survival. Why two years? Most people who have a cystectomy, if they're going to recur, a high percentage of them will, will recur within two years. So that two-year time point was appropriate, and um, it was a non-inferiority trial. So again, not a superiority trial, non-inferiority inferiority trial, which then uh, changes the power or the statistical calculations needed to, to prove that. And so you can see here, um, in general, there is really no significant difference between the two groups. If you looked at robotic and open, they pretty much had the same staging. You obviously don't want to have an unbalanced group where one group had all T4 and the other one had T1 is about the same. They all had the same number of patients that had lymph node dissections, lymph nodes removed, and the same percentage of patients with uh, positive margin. So again, a pretty equivalent group. And if you looked at the progression-free survival in both the analysis per protocol and the intention to treat is about 70% 70, 70 progression-free survival um, at that two-year mark, which was not significant. If you look at the next slide here, you can see the, uh, uh, the pro progression-free survival curves are pretty much non-overlapping. So really, it's an oncologically non-inferior uh, procedure, so you can do it in robotics. So it kind of put to bed some of the, out some of the, uh, the concerns that other people had about having weird recurrences uh, if using the robotic approach. Um, what about bigger data sets? If you look at the SEER Medicare database, again, a huge data set that, uh, that taps into you know, patients older than 65. 
and they also found no no real difference. There's a, a not you know overlapping um, uh, curves um, with regards to this. So really no difference. Looking at even bigger bigger data. Uh, so now that we've established that it's oncologically okay to use a robot to remove uh, the bladder using pneumoperitoneum, what about the morbidity? Uh, we all know that this operation is fun to do, but afterwards there's a lot of you know pain afterwards because these patients are sick. There's a lot of complications associated with these guys. You're going to see them in the get readmitted. You're, they're going to have issues afterwards, and, and you name it, they can have it. And it's not necessarily the most fun to take care of. It's not like doing a, a kidney or a prostate surgery where most people do pretty good. Um, it's just the nature of the operation. So complication rates can be as high as 60%, more, and mortality can be quite high as well. And so if you look at it, well, what, what, what is the morbidity? What is the mortality? This is a study out of Vanderbilt that looked at their uh, cystectomy database, focusing on 30 and 90 day complications. And you can see here that um, a majority of the complications are related to ileus, pyelonephritis. Again, those are, I would consider, diversion-related complications. You get, you get ileus probably not so much from doing a cystectomy, but probably from cutting the bowel and reanastomosing it. Same thing with the pyelonephritis. You get it from introducing the sterile urinary system now to a piece of bowel as you make your anastomosis. But you can see here that a majority of those complications were there. Their uh, reoperation rate was about, sorry, the reoperation rate was about 2% there. If you look at the uh, readmission rate, um, if you break it down, they broke it down early and late, less than 30 days, 30 to uh, 90 days. You can see here that it's 20, 20% early on, thir uh, late readmission was about 11%. And overall, uh, close to 30% of these patients are gonna get readmitted to the hospital for some reason, again, due to the nature of the operation. Um, how does this compare to other studies? Uh, if you look at the MedPAR database, which is a big uh, kind of national, large administrative database, has a 30-day readmission rate of about 20%. Memorial Sloan Kettering has a readmission rate of 26%. So again, highlighting the fact that these patients, after you do the operation, may come back to the hospital, uh, most likely related to diversion-related issues. Um, so what if we do a minimally invasive uh, approach for this? You know, what are you going to get? Well, these are the standard things that everybody claims with any minimally invasive uh, approach. You get less blood loss, which makes sense because you have pneumoperitoneum that reduces the amount of blood loss from, uh, from venous bleeding, reduce pain, shorter length of stay. Potentially, you might get fewer complications because you're doing it with smaller incisions and potentially improved quality of life. Smaller incisions mean you recover faster. You may be able to get back on uh, on track with your um, with your life a little quicker rather than having a big incision. Uh, so there's a lot of series here, a lot of single institution series here that that uh, look at this. And in general, the if you look at all these, it's about five to 12 days for hospital stay. A complication rate again, it depends on how you define it, but in these studies, is anywhere from 25 to about 46 uh, percent. And this is all with robotic cystectomy. Well, what if we, what about doing a bigger study? What about kind of making a randomized controlled trial to do it? And that's what they did at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Bernie Bachner did a study where they compared patients getting open cystectomy and open diversion and robotic cystectomy and open diversion. And again, note that in both groups, you had an open diversion. And I think that in a majority of cases, the, the diversion drives most of the complications. So you essentially had the same kind of approach for that. Well, what did they show? What were they trying to show? Here's kind of uh, the schema for their, their clinical trial. They basically had about 60 in, in um, the robot group and about 58 in the open group, and they were trying to identify patients that had a clavian 2 to 5 complication. Um, and so you can see here, uh, if you're looking at their study here, the clavian 2 to 5 uh, uh, complication rate was about 62% in the robotic group and about 66% in the open surgery group, it was not significantly different. So essentially, they had the same complication rate. Well, what were the complications? What were a majority of the complications that they had? If you look at it here, here's a list of all of them here. The highest percentages were gastrointestinal and infectious. Again, I think those are all related to the diversion. I don't think that you can argue much that the gastrointestinal side effects are from the cystectomy portion of the procedure removing the bladder. And so, did we really accomplish anything here? You can argue, um, you can make arguments on both sides, considering that both cases or both groups had an open diversion. So when you measure the wrong thing, maybe you get the wrong thing kind of, kind of situation. So there are some criticisms with this trial. One of them, uh, one of them that I already mentioned was is that um, 
the open and robot was only for the removal of the bladder, not necessarily the diversion. There was a low accrual rate in general, about 25%, uh, which raises some concerns about that. We don't really know who the surgeons were. We just know that they were very experienced robotic surgeons. Being a robotic uh, prostatectomist is different than a robotic cystectomist. And, uh, um, but again, uh, we don't really know what their uh, training was and experience was with cystectomies. Blood transfusion wasn't a complication. And so these are some of the criticisms with this trial. Um, what about the RAZOR trial? Again, that was the trial that we we're trying to see if there's any oncologic differences. And so they looked at some of their secondary endpoints here. And, um, and they basically found that uh, in patients that had the robotic approach, there was less transfusion, shorter length of stay, but again, it correlated with a longer operative time. There was no difference. If you look at the bottom part here, this is the claving complications. There's no real, no real difference between open and uh, the robotic approach with regards to these complications. Again, I think that they're mainly driven by the diversion. In this trial as well, um, all the diversions were done open. The cystectomy was done robotically, but all the other diversions were done using open. Uh, what about if you look at a bigger data set? You know, if you look at the uh, SEER, again, they show that the shorter length to stay with robotic, um, but really no difference in complication rate between the two. Going back to the meta-analysis that I mentioned earlier, if you look at their data, um, the complications tended to favor the robotic, uh, the robotic group. Um, they also had less blood loss in the robotic group, less transfusion rate, and a shorter length to stay in this, in this meta-analysis. And so then I think we gotta figure, you know, right now I think most of the focus that is on the cystectomy portion, right? You know, does the cystectomy change your complication rate? But should we really focus on the diversion part? And should we really focus on whether or not we're doing an intracorporeal versus an extracorporeal diversion? Will that matter? Does that change? Because that's the thing that really hasn't been looked at. Um, and at the end of the day, as kind of reiterating what I've said before, is the diversion the Achilles heel of this operation. I mean, I think that's where it, what drives the complications. You know, if you look at the cystectomy, it's blood loss, maybe you could get in the rectum, maybe a lymphocele. I think those are the big complications from there. But if you look at the, the diversion, I mean, that's, I think, where most of the complications happen, the electrolyte imbalances, the infections, the ileus, the, the fluid collections that develop, I think are all related to the, to the diversion. And so all the trials so far, all of them had extracorporeal diversion, so we can't really you know, comment on whether or not an intracorporeal diversion would be helpful or not. Um, is the Clavian system appropriate? That's what they used to compare the complications. They didn't really get to, into urology specific or even cystectomy specific complications. They just said, hey, they use this Clavian system which has its own, um, uh, own issues. And so at the end of the day, will intracorporeal diversion offer lower complication rate or not? Um, and will the increased operative time associated with doing an intracorporeal diversion offset some of these um, complications? And it's really, really hard to, to determine that. Um, if you look at the, there's a big consortium of all these cases done uh, robotically, a cystectomy is done robotically, and they try to divide them up into extracorporeal diversions and intracorporeal diversions. Again, it's retrospective data, non-randomized, um, and basically they found that there's a shorter, uh, shorter length of stay if you, um, with uh, an extracorporeal diversion, but the complication rate tended to be better um, if you did an intracorporeal diversion. Again, this is retrospective data, pooled data, not randomized data, but perhaps this might be a signal that there might be a benefit. Um, and perhaps we're measuring the wrong thing. If, you know, it doesn't matter if I use my hands to cut the intestine and reconnect it back up again and do the diversion, or if I use a robot to use the robotic instruments, you're still cutting the bowel, you're still re um, the urinary system to it, and you're still gonna have those issues one way or the other. And so perhaps maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. And so this is a study out of the UK where their primary endpoint is days out of the hospital within 90 days, so they're not necessarily looking at complications, but can they stay out of the hospital within 90 days? And some interesting secondary endpoints are kind of activity, you know, so are they getting back to their activity faster with smaller holes in them, smaller incisions with a robotic approach versus a large incision? And so you can see here, here's some prelim data here where they're trying to look at their baseline level and can they get back to their average steps per day quicker with a robotic approach uh, with an intracorporeal diversion? Or can they get back to, um, you know, the, there's a chair to stand time in 30 seconds, you know, so can you go from a chair to standing in less than 30 seconds? And, and that's kind of an 
arbitrary way to measure how fit or how functional it is. And so certainly something uh, interesting, and, and maybe this is what we should be looking at rather than, than complications. Um, and just real quickly, two, two more points. One is going to be a learning curve. Um, this operation it takes some time to get used to. If you look at the open radical cystectomy, Harry Herr published this uh, back in 2004. It says, well, what do you need to do to be competent at this? Maybe you need to do about 10 cases a year and they need a margin status of less than 10%. A lymph node yield of 10 to 14. Again, this is for open. Um, not much has really been written about robotic. Um, it can be daunting. There's a lot of steps involved. Uh, for those of you doing, you know, Ash does uh, a fair number. It's it takes a lot. It's a lot of steps. You have to have a lot of coordination with your team to do it. Um, and there's really not a lot of data out there about learning curve. Just like anything, the more reps you put into it, the more experience you have. I think the better you do at it. So this is some data from Raj Pruthi, who showed that, in his own personal experience. By case 20, he, he probably got to, uh, a good point on blood loss in terms of learning curve. Uh, by case 40, his operative time was pretty good. Um, and really, the lymph node count didn't really matter for him, he said. And so ultimately, I think that 20 cases for him, no difference in blood loss, 40 cases, he kind of reached his optimal operative time. Um, and so again, for those who are attempting uh, robotic cystectomy, if you're competent in prostatectomy, that's probably the next step is to try to do that. And then after that, consider doing an intracorporeal um, diversion. Uh, last thing is cost. Cost is expensive. My, you know, my, uh, my wife and I just, we recently had a baby boy, so it's a very exciting time. He's two weeks old and, and you know, we're getting the hospital bill and I, I have no clue what, what even happened in that. It's a very nebulous thing. And so cost, I think, in healthcare is very tricky to, to measure. And so how can you do it for cystectomy? We try our best looking at fixed costs, um, variable costs such as OR costs. You know, it, it's anesthesia and OR personnel obviously is a function of time. The longer you're in there, the more that's going to cost. And then the days in the hospital, you know, what a transfusion cost. So you try to systematically identify these and, and compare them. And, and I've got a couple studies here that showed uh, open versus robotic difference in price about $1,600. Here's another one from Memorial Sloan Kettering. The difference was $3,900, about $4,000 for a neobladder, $1,700 for a, a conduit. Um, so again, it's certainly more costly, um, but are we being able to capture or measure everything else? So the downstream consequences of doing a robotic approach, maybe you get to work faster, maybe you have less complications down the road that may make it uh, more cost effective not necessarily in the hospital stay, but, but down the road. And so that's hard to measure. Here's a paper uh, that was published that kind of summarized a lot of the cost data out there, looking at direct cost, indirect cost, and total cost. And this indirect cost is kind of hard, hard to measure. You know, what is the quality that you get? You know, how is the, your quality of life different? You know, can you get back to playing golf two months quicker if you do it one way or another or, or whatnot? And that's hard to really, hard to really measure. Um, so just to summarize everything, uh, from an oncologic standpoint, non-inferior, it's non-inferior. We got two-year data that suggests that. What about from a morbidity standpoint, blood loss, length of stay, pain, probably certainly better with a robotic approach. Um, the learning curve is, expect is, is acceptable, but certainly you have to put some time into it, and certainly focus on the experience that you have at prior, prior prostatectomies. And the last thing is, the cost. Certainly it's going to be upfront a little bit more just because of the robotic equipment and the time it takes to do it, but ultimately uh, do you get better value of it down the road in terms of uh, quality of life. So thank you everyone for your time. I appreciate it.